Hi, I'm Jeff Hajek, the owner and founder of Relaxion. This video is part of my lean training system. It was originally released as a DVD a long time ago, but times have changed and the look of some of these LTS videos is now a bit dated. The content is still spot on though. So rather than just discontinue the line, I am posting the majority of each of the 36 videos here with the remainder available at Velaction Videos. That's our video service where you can download a wealth of supporting content and watch subscriber only videos. I recommend subscribing and hitting the notification button if you want to make sure you don't miss any new content. I would also really appreciate if you would hit the like button if this video is helpful and you want to see more content similar to it. The like button helps us get found on YouTube, but it also lets us figure out where you want us to put our future effort. Now enjoy the free version of this video. Welcome to Vlaction Continuous Improvement's presentation on the fundamentals of A3 thinking. I am Jeff Hajek, the owner and founder of Vlaction Continuous Improvement. In this presentation, you will learn what an A3 report is, how to structure your thinking to be a more effective problem solver, and you'll get some tips on how to start using A3 reports to solve problems in your organization. Before we dive into the A3 report, let's talk about problem solving in general. The best way to do that is to first define what exactly a problem is. In short, a problem is a mismatch between expectations and reality. This generally happens in one of two ways. In the first manner, you see an opportunity, which means expectations rise. Suddenly, the way things should be are different from the current state and a gap forms. For example, you might hear that a competitor is offering a similar product to yours, but at half the lead time that you can meet. If you want to keep from losing sales, you'll have to match their capability. The other way is the more common perception people have about problems. Expectations and reality start out aligned, but then something changes. Perhaps you were able to ship orders within three days, but due to some undesired changes, it has crept up to five days, costing you sales. In this case, the expectation was constant, but reality changed. Again, there is a mismatch, the gap in the picture. Despite the different ways the two types of problems originate, though, the methods of solving them are similar. Of course, Problem solving is easier said than done. Apart from the challenge of clearly defining the should be and reality states, there are several reasons problem solving efforts fall short. The first, and by far the most common, is that people solve symptoms rather than problems. Think of it like treating a cold or the flu with medication, but never washing your hands before eating a meal. You are taking care of the symptoms but you are doing nothing to prevent future infections. The second reason is that there are often no clear goals. There is no way to judge when, or even if, the problem is solved. Part of this comes from a general aversion to being measured, but there are also logistical factors in play. Figuring out how to measure something can be challenging. Often, there is no data in existence or the data that does exist is not a perfect match to what you need. You may have to devote considerable time just to gaining an understanding of the current reality. And of course, there is the problem of consensus. Not only can it be difficult to get teams to agree on goals, but people may also not agree on the root cause of a problem. Both of these situations make it very hard to come up with a plan to improve things. I hope you are getting something valuable out of this video. If you want to get more out of this program, we recommend watching it on Velaction videos. You'll be able to watch the entire video, mostly ad-free, and view subscriber-only programs. You'll also have access to a load of continuous improvement downloads. Fortunately, though, there are several methods that help overcome these challenges in finding solutions. You may be familiar with several of these problem-solving methods. The DMAIC process, Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, Control, provides the underlying structure for Six Sigma. A more familiar problem-solving technique is a scientific method. 
If you think back to high school, you may recall that it involves posing a hypothesis and then proving it. 8D, or 8 disciplines, is very similar to Demaic, but adds in a few steps, notably finding a stopgap and celebrating success. Even the Kaizen event process goes through a series of problem-solving steps to achieve its goals. And of course, we can't forget about the A3 process, the topic of today's class. If you are familiar with these methods, you may be able to identify what they all have in common. All of these methods have, at their core, some form of the PDCA cycle, also known as the Deming cycle, after W. Edwards Deming. He was a lean pioneer credited with popularizing the Plan Do Check Act cycle. Of note, he actually refers to it as the Schuhart cycle in his book, Out of the Crisis. Walter Schuhart was another early, though less popular, proponent of improvement methods, notably statistical quality control. Schuhart, though, originally promoted more of a PDCS cycle, Plan Do Check Study. So what is the PDCA cycle? It is a structured approach to problem solving that many of us use intuitively. Unfortunately, as natural as a cycle is, we often skip steps, which leads to faulty problem solving. In general, we skip steps when we think we already have enough information. The problem is that, many times, we do not. The plan step is arguably the most important step. In it, problem solvers clearly define the problem and identify the root cause. A frequent problem in the plan step is that problem solvers assume that they know what is happening and why, so they don't actually do a root cause analysis and simply guess at what the underlying problem is. Sometimes they guess right, often they don't, and if they get this step wrong, every subsequent step will have no chance of making things better. In the plan phase, you also have to, not surprisingly, come up with a plan of attack on how you will approach the problem. A rule of thumb is to dedicate over half of your available time to the plan step. It prevents you from rushing to action and having to correct mistakes along the way. Instead, plan deliberately and then act on that plan quickly, but without the typical rework. Note that data collection is part of the plan step. The do step is obvious. It's where you actually implement the changes that you settled on in the plan step. Once you make the changes, you have to check your work. You want to confirm the results, but there is more to it than that. You want to make sure that you were able to predict the results correctly. Getting better is not the only thing that matters. You have to get better the way you expected to. If you can't predict correctly, you are probably off on your root cause analysis or at some other point in your planning. And if you are off, you will likely see problems creep back into your system. The final step is to take action. If everything worked out as planned, you lock in the gains. If not, you start over in the planning step and continue until you get the results that you predicted. There are many benefits to adding this structure to your problem solving methods. The most important is that it gets you thinking. Because you are spending your mental firepower on the actual problem and not on the details and logistics around solving the problem, you tend to get better results. And being able to focus on the issues leads to a deeper understanding of a problem. And of course, when you have greater knowledge about a problem, you can share that information better with others, which makes it more likely that they will agree with you. In the end, a structured problem-solving approach helps get rid of the mistakes and the waste that tends to plague continuous improvement efforts. As part of the Lean training system this video comes from, we offer a variety of Lean LEGO training packages. These include our Lean LEGO flow simulation, mistake-proofing or Pokeyoke Lean LEGO exercise, and our visual controls and 5S Lean LEGO exercise. We've also got an office flow simulation for those not implementing continuous improvement on the shop floor. Click the links in the description below, or click on cards that pop up on this video to learn more. We'll also add links at the end. So let's talk a little about what an A3 report is. 
If you are familiar with my training, you'll know that I like to present things with analogies. I find people are often familiar with lean principles and tools, even if they don't realize it. When they see that they already understand many of the underlying concepts, it's much easier for them to learn. In this case, let's take a look at architecture. An A3 report in problem solving is analogous to the blueprint in architecture. Think about what a blueprint really is. It is a representation of a solution to a problem that a customer has. The customer has a set of requirements for the eventual building. A blueprint is the distillation of all the work that went into coming up with a way to meet those needs. What that means is that the blueprint supports the PDCA process. Think about it. There is a lot of background effort that goes into a blueprint. You need a survey of the land to make sure the building will fit. You need to do loads of calculations to make sure the building is sound. You have to make sure it meets zoning regulations. A builder can't just draw up a blueprint on the fly. And of course, the blueprint is not the end of the project. The builder still has to organize the contractors to actually put up the walls and do the wiring and all the other work that needs to be done. And even after the building is done, the blueprint still has value. It becomes a tool to check that the structure was built correctly. One more thing to consider. A blueprint is not going to be perfect the first time. Customers will undoubtedly see something the architect drew that they will want changed. Or seeing the blueprint will trigger a thought about another need that the customer had not previously considered. The use of a blueprint is a process, not an event. The same holds true for an A3 report in dealing with a problem. The report is not the output, just a tool to get a good result. It is a summary of all the work that goes into solving a problem. It is often referred to as a storyboard and follows a general flow between the sections. The sections of the A3 match the PDCA cycle. Generally, the left side will be the plan step. This template includes sections for the background, current condition, goal setting, and root cause analysis. On the right side, you'll often see a countermeasures section where you actually implement the changes you settled on in the plan phase. You then confirm the effects of your changes. And finally, do follow-up. This section is intended to both spread improvements throughout the organization and to specifically identify additional opportunities that go beyond the original goals of the project. In the process of turning over a lot of rocks while doing the A3, you have a good chance of uncovering another improvement idea. The follow-up section prevents that potential gain from falling through the cracks. Let's look at a plan side in more detail. The first thing you might notice is that it covers half the page. That, in and of itself, should demonstrate how important proper planning is. I recommend you spend at least half of your time planning, even more when the problem is complicated. This may seem in contrast to the Kaizen concept of making quick, on-the-spot improvements. The short answer is that you won't use an A3 in every situation. You should still follow the A3 thinking process, PDCA, to come up with an answer, though. With practice, you'll be able to decide when to just make a quick change and when to spend a lot of time planning. Moving a garbage can closer to where it is needed or improving the 5S in your work area are both unlikely to need significant planning time. As you get more accustomed to continuous improvement, you'll find that the higher the risk or the more people that are affected, the more intensive planning should be. The top section of the A3 is the background. It is simply an overview of what the problem is. It should address the impact of the problem and link to corporate goals if possible. The next section is the current condition. It provides more detail about the current state of the process or system and puts a little more light on what the problem really is. Of course, you can't solve a problem without clear goals. And as I mentioned earlier, you need to do a good root cause analysis to fully understand the problem so you don't end up treating symptoms. I want to step back from the template in this example for just a moment. 
One thing that is hard for people to understand is that there really is no set format for an A3 report other than the A3 size sheet of paper it is on. It should, however, be organized as a storyboard and must follow the PDCA cycle. In a company that is using A3 reports regularly, you will see many different section headings and the size of the boxes will vary. Adjust it as needed. The right hand side of the A3 is used once you start putting your solution in place. It starts with a countermeasures section. This is where you manage the project and track each of the chosen countermeasures as they are tried out and implemented. But not all countermeasures are quick and easy to implement, so they may have many steps to them that won't fit on the A3 document. In that situation, you would just list the top level task and its status. You'd use a separate action plan to keep all the small steps on track. In fact, the same is true for all the sections. The A3 is a summary of all the work that went into it. Consider the blueprint example again. There is a lot of math for load calculations and budget, and research on selecting the best materials, and a lot of other work that goes on that doesn't appear on a blueprint. Similarly, for your A3, a lot of work happens behind the scenes. For example, your root cause analysis may require an extensive data collection plan and multiple pivot tables. All you would see on the A3 is a snapshot that summarizes all that work. A final point about the countermeasures section. Many will have their own PDCA cycle as you test how to implement them. You will be unlikely to get each one right the first time. Eventually, though, you will complete the countermeasures and move on to confirming that the problem was indeed solved. Again, I want to stress that being able to properly predict the results is important. If you didn't get what you expected, but still liked the results, you are relying on luck for improvement, not a good long-term plan. Following the problem-solving process is as important as getting good results. The last section is the follow-up. In the A3 report, the PDCA cycle works on a few layers. As you are working on the problem, you'll use the PDCA cycle to dial in each of the countermeasures. But part of the strength of the A3 process is that you will also check and act on the whole plan. There are two main reasons for this. The first is to systematically spread knowledge. Any A3 author should consider who else shares similar problems and make sure that the knowledge is passed along. A common shortcoming of many companies is that they have pockets of excellence but are not adept at bringing all parts of the company up to the same level. The second reason is to choose which of the uncovered opportunities you might want to act upon. As you dive into problems, you'll identify deeper issues faster than you can resolve them. The follow-up section helps you manage your resources. Get more out of our Lean Training System videos with our Continuous Improvement Companion. It's closing in on a thousand pages of great content. It is currently available as a download with a subscription to Vlaction Videos and as a license through our store. You can also get a free version of it by signing up for our newsletter. Click the links in the description below or click on the cards that pop up on this video to learn more. We'll also add links at the end. Now that you have a better understanding of what an A3 report is, Let's talk a bit about where it came from. As you may know, Toyota is credited as the originator of the A3 report. They have been using it for many years. And they brought it to North America when they started ramping up production there in the 1980s. Around the turn of the century, A3 reports started getting more press, and in the following years, interest in them steadily picked up steam. As the A3 process became more widespread, Toyota was dealing with some serious woes regarding the perception of its quality. But despite the short-term challenges it faced, it has had a rather long, uninterrupted run of success. Many people attribute its achievements to the A3 report, or more accurately, to the A3 thinking behind the report. It is surprising to many, though, that as instrumental as the A3 process has been to Toyota's rise, that the company would share its knowledge. The main reason for this is that Toyota wants to be a good corporate citizen. Its leadership realizes that the world gets better as knowledge is shared. 
but that isn't all there is to it. If it was, Toyota would share all its knowledge, such as the hybrid technology it used to really launch that market. But since it doesn't share everything, there has to be more to it. Toyota wants to make the world better, but at the same time retain its leadership. When they share knowledge about the A3, they know one important fact. Their head start makes it hard to copy them. People hear about it and try to simply start using the piece of paper with a bunch of boxes on it. So what's the problem? Think of the A3 report like the tip of an iceberg. What companies miss is something that Toyota knows very well. The A3 report is very limited in its effectiveness without a strong support structure in place. That structure, the part of the iceberg below the waterline, is the embedded A3 thinking and corporate culture that powers improvement at Toyota. Fortunately, though, you most likely have many parts of that structure already in place. Creating that support system is probably not a project you have to start from scratch. You will most likely be building on some existing strengths. The challenge will be figuring out what you already do well and then closing the gaps to create a rock-solid foundation. So what is under that iceberg? That structure is centered on a continuous improvement culture. That simply means that the whole team is both motivated and empowered to make gains and is skilled to do so. A culture doesn't develop overnight, and it doesn't flourish if there is not something in it for all the members of that organization. If you want to get a continuous improvement culture to grow in your company, the frontline employees have to see that there is something in it for them. As I mentioned, a strong continuous improvement culture requires certain skills to make it successful. One of the most important skills is the ability to think critically about problems. This means that team members must understand things like run charts, Pareto charts, and flow charts. The more skilled they are with these tools, the more effective A3 thinking will be for the company. You can see how the right organization and corporate identity will create a solid A3 foundation. For example, in the root cause analysis section, there's a lot of back and forth discussion about problems, and those discussions cross the boundaries of job function. Many problems originate far upstream. People must have working relationships with employees in other functional areas. The employees in a company have to be able to discuss things with each other without assigning blame and without getting defensive. Considering that the A3 process is all about dealing with problems, there's a high likelihood that some dirt will be uncovered as people dig. That level of public scrutiny takes some getting used to. There also has to be some philosophical changes within a company. For example, people need to be able to feel that if they follow a reasonable process, they can fail without punishment. Not all problem-solving efforts will work out, but if people feel at risk when they try things, they will not stick their necks out. Finally, and this is the big one, the company must emphasize mentoring. That means letting subordinates make decisions and spending time developing them. Often, that includes people that don't even work for that mentor. If you want to be world class, you have to share knowledge from the best sources, not just the most conveniently located ones. It is rare to find managers who will devote their time outside of their own areas of responsibility but world-class performance requires it. Let's talk a bit about the A3 for a moment from a general perspective. As I have mentioned, there is no set format other than the fact that it is a storyboard that follows the PDCA cycle. It is typically done on an A3-sized piece of paper, which is similar to the ledger-sized 11 by 17 in the U.S., there is some push, however, to go to an even smaller synopsis on an 8.5 by 11 sheet, or letter size. A3 reports are traditionally handwritten, though many of the reasons for doing that are beginning to erode. I'll talk in more detail about that in a few minutes. Again, the A3 report is a summary of a lot of work that goes into each section. Because there is a lot of background information, it makes sense to use graphics when possible. Images, charts, and sketches tend to convey information more concisely than text does. As far as the purpose of A3s, the most common version, 
and the one I am focusing on today is the problem-solving A3. Other types include the proposal A3 and the status A3, though both are more likely to be done at higher levels of the organization and for more complicated projects. This video comes from Volaction's Lean Training System, which takes a module-based approach to learning about continuous improvement. Modules include a PowerPoint presentation and student guides for every video, plus there are many exercises and quizzes as well. There's also a whole host of supporting content in the form of terms in our Continuous Improvement Companion and downloadable articles. Our modules are currently available in our store and as downloads at Volaction Videos. Click the links in the description below or click on the cards that pop up on this video to learn more. We'll also add links at the end. I've alluded to a lot of the reasons to do an A3 report earlier in this presentation. The first reason is that following a specific process prevents mistakes and reduces waste. But that consistency also lets people work together better. The A3 format, as a communication tool, makes it easy to quickly bring others up to speed. And while I haven't talked much about it yet, the A3 is a living document. That means that there will be a lot of discussion about the information contained in it and a lot of back and forth as the document evolves. The familiar look of the A3 and the adherence to the process makes that collaboration seamless. And that ease of recruiting help and discussing the problem with your boss makes the conversation go much more quickly than if it required a lot of background information. That saves valuable time that can be used to solve other problems. And of course, Fewer mistakes prevents the rework that also consumes the limited time available to make improvements. And when things are easier and more effective and more clear and concise, people grasp onto them better. The A3 format helps make sure that gains don't just happen in the area within the scope of the project. It also makes it easy to apply the gains elsewhere. Add in the focus on a follow-up within a report and gains will spread throughout the company much more easily. And not only will they spread more, but they will be more likely to stick. The A3 method, because of its focus on the root cause, tends to make gains more permanent. And seeing that successful problem solving makes people more likely to believe that continuous improvement is effective, which in turn makes people more likely to commit to making things better. Another big benefit is the fact that an A3 requires an owner. That ownership, and the authority and responsibility that go with it, makes people stick with problems to the end. Group ownership tends to lead to social loafing, which sounds bad, but is really just human nature. When people get really busy, they have to prioritize. The tasks with no backup, the ones that are guaranteed to fail if they aren't addressed personally, tend to get worked on first. The tasks that have other people involved become secondary. Unfortunately, everyone often thinks the same way, so group tasks tend to slip through the cracks more than individual ones do. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the A3 process creates learning and teaching opportunities. Because of the structure and the inherent coaching involved, team members can be challenged with projects of ever-increasing complexity. I can't stress enough the value of creating a culture where people can grow professionally. Not only does it get more done for the company, but it improves job satisfaction and helps with retention. People like having opportunities to shine. And when they get set up for success, as the A3 system does, they can capitalize on those opportunities. So, how does the A3 report fit into your company? Initially, you are likely to see A3 reports used on an individual basis. Before there is a general understanding of their value, they will be used by a few people scattered throughout the company. The structure of the report will certainly make a person more effective at problem solving. But bigger gains come when the process is understood more broadly throughout the company. This is because of the collaborative nature of the A3 process. Each of the sections requires discussion and research. When other people know what you, as an A3 author, is doing, they're more likely to help. And that assistance will provide deeper insight into problems and more options when it comes time to select countermeasures. But the real power comes when a company reaches a state where A3 thinking is woven into the culture. At that point, people think in terms of root cause, cooperate with problem solvers, recognize the authority of the A3 author, and so on. Plus, A3 thinking prevents complacency. 
People become less tolerant of problems because they believe there is an effective way to make things better. At this point, I am going to jump from the theoretical discussion about an A3 and talk about a specific example. When I choose case studies for my presentations, I try to stay away from actual business examples. What I've found is that real-world examples are great when they relate to what you're trying to do. But when the example doesn't match a person's job, specific examples can make them tune out. Shop floor workers and managers might not see how an office process relates to them and vice versa. Or a person may work in a similar function and question some of the assumptions or processes used in the example. For that reason, this video uses a neutral example. In this case, we are going to look at how I used an A3 report to stop showing up late for work. In my A3 example, you will notice that the information was generated with a PC. As I mentioned earlier, the A3 originated well before the proliferation of the desktop computer, so they were initially done completely by hand. Now that computers are ubiquitous and much easier to operate, more and more A3 reports are being done with a PC. Both of the images on a screen convey the same information. At this point, most people prefer the look of the completed computer-generated form. But during the process of actually creating the A3, it is not so easy to point to one format as better than the other. Let's look at the benefits of each. The benefits of using a digital device are what you would expect. The most obvious benefit is that the report is far neater and more legible. Some people are seriously impaired in their writing ability. Sloppy writing at best creates waste and at worst creates confusion. Digital A3 reports are also easier to share and collaborate on. Consider the ability to post an A3 on a network drive and work with a team member in another state. With a paper copy, that cooperation becomes more difficult. Plus, it is easy to make changes and print out a new copy. Well-traveled A3s get crumpled and worn from regular erasing and updating. They are often rewritten, which can seem wasteful. Thanks for watching this extended free version of our Lean Training System module video. If you want to watch the whole video, check it out at Velaction Videos. If you want to make sure you don't miss the next LTS video that we post, please be sure to subscribe down below. We also always appreciate likes as it helps us get viewed more and makes us keep adding additional content. Thanks for watching and best wishes on your continuous improvement journey.